interesting dynamics to be there if anything happens in the field. Um, yeah, just kind of to be an Earth Watch representative and make sure things go smoothly. And, and today photos. And today photos, yes. Yeah. Which mark I should know it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in February um, on this expedition, and it was the best expedition I've ever been on. And I've been on seven, um, so that's a lot of things. And there are five reasons why. but it's definitely a lot more remote. And where we were, all the way down here, um, also pretty remote. There's not too much else going on there. And it was just gorgeous. Um, the beaches, the water, the sunrises, the stars, both in the sea and in the sky, were amazing every day. Um, and in addition to that, where you're actually staying for the expedition is really cool. Um, so you're staying at Cape Eleuthera Institute slash the island school. Um, which is on that, that tip of the island. Has anyone else been there on Harborn? It's the same place as Harborn. No one else? No? Okay. Um, and it's just a really cool place. There's a lot of research going on, besides sea turtles, besides coral reefs, there's sharks, there's invasive species, um, and there's also lots of other groups coming and going. So the island school has semester program for high school students. There's also other groups that came in and out while we were there. So you're in this sort of little community, and everyone's very friendly. You meet people from all over the world. Um, and and even, you know, over conversations at dinner and breakfast, you can meet lots of different people. Um, and you, by the way, you sit and eat breakfast here overlooking the ocean is there. Um, <laughs> it's all outdoors. It's very beautiful. We have They have wonderful cooks who cook for you, and considering they're cooking for 100 to 200 people a day. The food was pretty damn good. Um, the, the, the salad was really fresh and made there. Um, so that's the other great thing about this place is it's very sustainable. So this sign here is in the back of all the bathroom doors. Um, all their electricity is, is, su is from the sun and from the wind. Um, and they encourage you, strongly encourage you to do uh, things like turn the lights off, um, save water where you can, so take navy showers. Um, they use the, the phrase, if it's yellow, let it mellow, if it's brown, flush it down. Um, and people were doing that. <laughs> um, and so, um, so people really, when you go there, you kind of, um, everyone embodies this idea of sustainability, which is really great. Um, you can use bikes to go down to the marina. Um, and then this picture is for Kim and Lloyd. <laughs> this is, um, they have a medic on site. And this is their, their little medic room. <laughs> um, so lots of uh, field supply, medical supplies. Um, they are far from a hospital, so it's really great that they have someone on site that can handle and handle pretty much anything uh, besides for really big emergencies. So it's a really, really cool place. Number two, the scientists. Um, so Annabelle Brooks is the PI. Um, she's been at uh, Cape Eleuthera Institute for about eight years, living and working in the Bahamas. So she's a resident, which makes her really knowledgeable about lots of things. Um, she has a background in, in marine ecology, so she doesn't just study sea turtles, but has studied coral reefs and lionfish and all sorts of things. So she can just tell you lots of different things. She was a, a project staff member, uh, well, she still is, on Harborn, so she also was used to running Earthwatch expeditions, but this is the first time she was the lead. Um, and her research assistant, Megan, was also really great. She um, also is sort of a repeat visitor to um, Cape Eleuthera Institute, or CEI. She was there as an island school student in, in high school, then she came back as an intern in college, and now she's here back full time as a research assistant before she goes to grad school to study sea turtles. So she was really young, but she had really great um, group dynamics, uh, or group management skills, um, as did Annabelle. Um, you can tell Annabelle's worked with a lot of volunteers and groups before. She could really read people. She could read when you know people were kind of feeling down about certain, you know, if activity didn't go well or something, and she would take us out snorkeling and we'd have a great time. So, so she really knew how to manage people. And if um, she needed to be firm, she could be firm. But generally, she was really laid back, um, very personable, and really just great with volunteers. So number three, the team was really great. Um, we had there were nine of us. And we had someone in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s 
which I think is um, pretty unusual. Usually it's like 60s and 70s and 20s. Um, so we had a nice spread, which was really cool. Um, about half and half were, were past team members that had been on expeditions before, and others were brand new. Um, one person in particular, um, she actually spent her 30th birthday on the expedition, and instead of her friends buying her gifts for her 30th birthday, she set up an expedition fund, mm. and people um, paid into it, and so she got to go for free as gifts from her family and friends, which I thought was really cool, um, that she wanted to spend her 30th birthday doing Earthwatch. It was her second team. Um, so really great team, got along pretty well, um, and everyone had brought something different to the table. So um, the other thing that was great is that everyone knew um, Alex and Jasmine. So they they know they know they're not just calling Earthwatch. They have a name and a face, and so, or not a face, but a name at least. So they knew of them, which was really great. <coughs> and fourth reason, the research. So if you've ever been by my desk, you may know that I like sea turtles. Um, <laughs> I actually studied them for my master's degree, um, and so um, this was certainly a project I had my eye on from the moment Heather sent out the expedition update. <laughs> um, and this is really studying juvenile turtles, um, so turtles in between when they're little tiny hatchlings and when they go, they're adults and mate. Um, we mostly, we only caught greens, but they do sometimes also study hawksbills. Um, and can anyone tell me what? Um, why sea, sea turtles are important, maybe from Brittany's uh, presentation a couple of months ago. You don't have to answer, but you <laughs> <laughs> may know from, from your presentation. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I guess they would just contribute to the ecosystem like any other sea creature in the sea. Well, adult sea turtles are particularly important because so few of them make it to a breeding age because I think it's something like out of a nest of 200 eggs, um, I think that they're, you're lucky to have one or two make it to a uh, mature adult. Yeah, one in a thousand. Actually. One in a thousand. There we yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was my next. Step. And don't they? <laughs> didn't they like affect some kind of um, plant life on the the shore? Well, didn't she say that? Yeah, we need the sea turtles to come and do certain things that affect the plant well, life. Well, one thing they they actually definitely affect the plant life in the water. So particularly greens, they are they are green sea turtles. Um, partially, I think, because they, they eat green seagrass and algae, um, and sometimes they actually look green because they've got algae growing on them. So they're kind of like lawnmowers of the sea. So if they weren't there, the grass and the algae would get go, go a little crazy, and there'd be too much of it, and that wouldn't be good for the balance of the ecosystem. There's a lot of other creatures that live in that ecosystem, and so they kind of keep it in check. Um, so that's why particularly greens are important. And there's a lot of threats to the sea. Oh. And you can see, if you can see on the, the little teeth there, they've got like little chomping teeth there, so you can see that. Um, other other um, sea turtles that eat like crustaceans and things have a bigger beak, um, so they, it's one way to tell them apart from the others. Um, and of course, there's a lot of threats to sea turtles too. Um, overfishing, they get caught in, in lines as bycatch. Um, in the past, they have been actually um, taken and, and eaten, but the Bahamas actually banned that. So Bahamas is a safe zone for sea turtles, which is great, but they're still recovering from a lot of those um, issues in the past. And, and a big thing is habitat loss. So um, where they nest um, on beaches and shorelines is where a lot of people like to live and, and build. Um, so that definitely affects them. But also here at, in the juvenile stage, they like to be in, in shallow, warm waters around the Bahamas, where also people like to build, and that can certainly have an effect on the, on the water around it. Um, so basically what they wanted to see was a lot of people um, study the adult sea turtles, um, but they wanted to study these guys because um, they're not sure exactly why they choose a certain area to feed. Um, so they're coming to the Bahamas to feed, they know that, but you know what makes them pick, pick a particular site over another? Is it food availability? Um, is it just the habitat itself and the water chemistry or the temperature? Is it the absence of pre predators? So we were basically testing um, what makes a sea turtle choose where it wants to be and, and how, um, where, if it would stay where it is or it would go around the island or you know, how long, where, where would it move within a, a smaller zone. So a lot of people study sea turtles in their migratory patterns across the oceans, but, but they, they want to look at sort of a smaller scale of that. So the first way we 
did this um, is by doing some habitat mapping. So the scientists have these really um, high resolution images of, of the whole island. And what they want to do is create a map and ground truth some of the data that they're getting from the pictures um, with actual people on the ground checking to say, okay, yes, there's seagrass here. So when they go back to their GIS and their map, they can confirm that this color from, from the photo actually equals seagrass or sand or coral or something else. So we did a lot of this um, and we kind of put out a little square under the water, um, take a picture, uh, take a GPS point, measure the water height, um, and also check what was there, so what species of algae or plant life and things like that. Um, it was definitely not the most exciting part of the expedition, but um, the scientists made sure to remind us how important it was, um, because if we have all this data on where sea turtles are and we don't really know what's underneath, it's not going to be as useful. Um, and so we were able to like quadruple the data set that they had already had started on this, which was really good, just by the sheer number of us we broke up into two teams and we could get it done. We did it in multiple sites all around the, the southern tip of the island. The second thing we did, which is um, looking at predators. So maybe a sea turtle is choosing a certain site because there aren't many predators around there. Um, and the main predators of these guys would be sharks. Um, and a lot of juvenile sharks like to hang around in the same kind of region, shallow, warm waters. So we put out these things called BRUVs, so they're Baited Remote Underwater Video Surveys. And it's basically like a camera trap. You have a, a GoPro camera here, encased in a waterproof casing, um, and it's in this big square, or cube, that we actually built, being the first team, we had to build them, so that was kind of a cool task. And then extending from that is a long pole with bait at the end, so basically ground up fish, which is also a volunteer task. I stayed away from that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, some people were really into it, um, and getting smelly and gross. Um, and so we, we put, drop these off in shallow areas, um, and it, had, it also had like a weight attached and sometimes a buoy, and we'd leave it there for a couple hours, and then we'd come back. Um, so it was really exciting um, when we would come back and, and watch the videos, actually can be really boring because if there's nothing there then you're just watching a thing float in the water for two hours. Um, <laughs> but we caught a lot of stuff on film. So um, you can see there we, we caught a shark. We caught three species of shark on, on camera. Um, we, we caught a nurse shark which is featured here. This is actually not from the grub but from a snorkeling trip that we did. Um, and a lemon shark and a tiger shark which was really really exciting. And that one we caught um, when we pulled the bruv up, the little bait thing was gone. So we knew something big had been there, and we were really excited to get back and see it. So was the scientist, you could tell. She definitely wasn't expecting us to catch as much as we did. I think we put about 10 of these out, and we caught something on, like, six of them. Um, we also saw, like, lots of fish. We saw a barracuda that, that kept, like, swimming around and around and kind of, like, protecting this bait and, and nipping at it, um, which was really funny. And then the last thing we saw was a bunch of crabs who were fighting over it. And that was actually really hilarious to watch. They would like pull out their, their claws. And, like, there were, first there were two, and then there were three, and then there were like seven, and they were all fighting over this bait. So it was really cool. Um, I don't have the videos that we took, because the scientist hasn't really cut them in and edited them yet. But I do have a video um, to show you of what it looks like um, underwater. That's from actually the scientist's husband who does shark research here, or uh, in the Bahamas. So you can see actually this sea turtle has a shark bite taken out of it. We didn't see any sea turtles on our video. But this is a, um, a tiger shark, which is the one that took our bait off completely. This we did not see. <laughs> this is in deeper water, but this is a hammerhead. Uh, we only did shallow water. Huh. And I believe this is a lemon. We sell these. And this is a nurse shark that 
they kind of bottom feeders. They don't have big sharp teeth. They kind of suck up the ground. But they're very strong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our poles stayed intact, but our bags got taken at least two or three times. <laughs> Well, they, they tend to just chew on it until the stuff comes out, yeah. I think they do biodegrade with the plastic they use. It's yeah. not it's still plastic, but it's not the worst plastic. So, so yeah, um, that was something I definitely wasn't expecting, um, was was the, the shark stuff. Um, because, you know, I was thinking about sea turtles, and, and so that was sort of an added bonus. Although, you know, it was in the briefing and everything that we'd be doing this, but... Um, it, it was it was really cool because um, these GoPros have the scientists said has totally revolutionized um, underwater filming. Um, before that, you have to get really really expensive equipment down there, and you could get down there and it, you could lose it, or you could just you know film nothing. Whereas these are so like a couple hundred dollars, and we have three of them, and so it's it's really like um, really awesome for for marine research and other research too. So finally, the sea turtle abundance and distribution. Um, so we did this two ways. One was through seining. So we would put out this big seine net in a, in a tidal creek and um, wait for the sort of tide to come out and then see what we, we caught. Um, and when they, when they did that, um, we caught one sea turtle that day. But we were also able to catch um, a, a baby shark and also um, a bunch of bonefish, and there were other researchers out there at the time, so the volunteers also got to assist with tagging bonefish, and got to see um, see the shark up close and everything, so it was still a really cool experience, besides also catching a sea turtle, so just, you know, they get to experience a lot of different research while they're there. And then, um, the most exciting part, at least for me, um, turtle chasing, or rodeoing, as they call it. Um, <laughs> So, rather than me explain it, I'm going to show you another video that I took to give you a sense of what it's like. There's no sound right now, but you're kind of in the boat, and if you see a turtle, you put your hand out like that, and then you can see it in the water there, and the, the boat driver just follows your hand, basically. And you wait to get really close to it. And, <laughs> um, and you usually wait about four times till it comes up, because you know that it's starting to get tired, um, and it's come up for breath a couple times before you put anyone in the water. Um, and once, uh, let me just get the other video out. Once we're ready, you put someone out um, in the water, and you basically jump right in. You need to keep your eye on the sea turtle and swim above it. And the idea is to get in front of it, so if this is a sea turtle, you're here, so that when it comes up for air, you can just grab it. Um, <laughs> which <I've> done. <laughs> um, so here, you can also dive down and try and get it. Um, I never tried that because I was afraid I was going to lose it. Some people were successful with that. He wasn't. Um, <laughs> but you'll see in a second, someone's ready on the boat, ready to jump right in. Um, because you get really tired doing this. Um, it, you swim your heart out, and they, they are super fast underwater. Um, so she's about to jump in, and you'll see her kind of take off and pretty much jump right on top of the turtle. Right there. <laughs> it's so cool. So, it, it was literally the most exhilarating field work I've ever done. When you're sitting there waiting to jump in, like my heart is pounding, and you're, and you're so worried that like you're gonna miss it. Um, but it's really a team effort. Um, in some cases, it took six of us, you know, swimming our hearts out, and then you put your hand up when you're tired. You've got this inflatable vest that you can wear while you float, and because the boat can't pick you up right away. Um, and then the next person goes in. You know, one, one sea turtle that was quite big took six of us to, to, to get down. So it's obvious that the, the scientists need volunteers, especially for this task. Is that a sea lion? Yeah. How heavy are they? Um, that's a very good question. It really depends on size. So 
Um, some of them were really small, and I mean, you see there, really light, but they did catch one that was over 50 pounds. So um, once you get the, the turtle, you bring it back to the boat, um, and then you take a lot of measurements. You measure the turtle's shell. Um, you put a tag on it if it doesn't already have one. Um, and a lot of the ones we caught actually had tags already, so they were recaptures. Um, this is Megan, and she's also doing a study where she's putting a little temperature data logger on it. Um, so she drills a little hole in the shell and attaches this little device. And then so, again, if she recaptures it, she can see, like, what the temperature range is that they're swimming in. Um, you take a picture of the shell to kind of look at individuals. And, um, and you weigh it. And the, the weight is the, <coughs> the weight measure, um, the scale, is only for 50 pounds because normally you just catch small ones. But one of the ones they caught was over that. So, um, so yeah, they can be, be pretty heavy. Um, the little ones are pretty easy to catch. You kind of catch them with under their armpits. Um, yeah, but it, it, it was just really cool. And not everyone was into jumping into the water. Um, some people tried it and were just not comfortable. Um, but it was okay because there was so much to do on the boat when the turtle came on the boat that they got to do um, lots of other things. So this is Jim. He was my favorite. Um, he's, he's been on nine expeditions. He loves Earthwatch. He's 72. Um, and we called him the turtle whisperer because every time a turtle came on boat, he was here holding her down, like, calming her down, and pinned down. Um, you can't actually tell the sex um, at this point. But, yeah, so, so he was perfectly happy doing that. You know, he didn't need to jump in. And it was a really great balance. Like, we had about half the people who were really super into jumping in and half the people who were really into the measurement and all of that. And everyone got to try everything, so that was really great. Um, and the last thing was... My volunteer experience. So, as Katie was saying, I, you go as a volunteer, and every other expedition I've been on, I've been a facilitator, or a field team leader, or a field director, and I've been in charge. Um, and so it was nice to not be in charge and enjoy the experience, although I did support the scientist whenever she needed it, and, you know, looked out for things. I reminded people to wear their seatbelts, as you always have to do. Um, and, you know, I got to enjoy this um, from a volunteer perspective, including hurting my foot, <laughs> um, because I was just so excited to get in the water. I jumped off the boat a little too hard and landed and sprained my ankle. Um, mm. And it was only a day that I had to stay back from the field. And they took really good care of me, so Annabelle kept asking if it was a test, and I did it on purpose. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, it was just me being too excited to get into water that looked like that. Um, and, um, and, you know, even though I stayed back, I helped with data entry, and she made sure I was okay, and had people check it in on me, and I got to go um, watch the shark team try and tag a bull shark, which was cool. Um, so I got to do other stuff, so she really, you know, she really knows how to manage teams, and um, it was a really awesome experience. We also got to snorkel in amazing waters, um, and as I said, Annabelle often let us do that when we had a less exciting day, not catching turtles and things like that. So um, it really was an amazing experience. I recommend this project to anyone and everyone. Um, and I think it's going to bring in a lot of volunteers and a lot of interest um, in terms of the public, too. So. Awesome. Thank
shark blah, blah, blah. Um, and then also entering the measurements of the sea turtle. Do all turtles have different patterns on their back? Is that how they identify whether... Yeah, they can look at individuals. Yeah, and everyone was different and beautiful, and, and, and that's why I love... But that. they do tag them, so then they know yeah, exactly which one it was. Do they name them? They were. No, they don't <laughs> name them, because I think, you know, that's kind of being a little biased and <laughs> getting away from science. A little. Uh -huh. huh? Well, I was first. just wondering, because when I was on the dolphin expedition, they all had names. Oh, really? Yeah, there was 150 dolphins, and they all had names. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. Diana, can you tell us um, you tr how was your trip from point A to point B, and how was the um, where you go you were located, the atmosphere? Yeah. How was it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually left on a snowstorm day in Boston. Got Good out call. just in time. Um, <laughs> 8 a.m. flight. Laughing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I was really not sure I was going to make it, um, but and, and actually three volunteers didn't on the day, um, which Alex knew about. <laughs> um, but um, I, so I flew from Boston directly to Nassau and then waited in Nassau for a little plane over to Eleuthera. And then you take a 40-minute um, bus ride they pick you up at the, at the airport and they take you to the station. Um, and then... We stayed in a room with six people, so all bunk beds, um, but you had your own bunk beds, so there was like 12 technical beds, six people. And then you, there was an identical room next to it um, with a school group that we shared a bathroom with. Um, and that was one thing I didn't say. We, we did have to do chores, um, so every other day you had to clean the bathroom, and then every couple of days you were on dish duty, so you helped clean up the dishes from a particular meal. Um, so yeah, so um, you still had to do some chores while you were there. Um, but it is part of the whole community and the communal feeling behind the place where you're staying. Everyone pitches in. Did you find that all the volunteers were equipped properly to be able to do the work? You know, um, were they fit? Were they sc screened? I mean, did there was there any indication to you that there was any no, fitness issues? No, I think issues? they all knew what they were getting in into. Um, like one person bought a rash guard, which is like the, the top that you wear mm -hmm. surfing. Um, but she didn't bring one, but she's, they had them there, and so she bought one. So, um, so yeah, um, people had different, some people had a wetsuit, some people didn't. Um, but no, everyone was fit enough. As I said, some people didn't feel comfortable swimming um, and weren't as strong as swimmers, but there was plenty of other things for them to do that it was totally fine. So I'm working on a project for 2015, and there's a lot of boat safety that we're getting up to standard. Was there anything that this experienced PI did particularly well with, the, in terms of boat safety or yeah. safety briefings? Yeah, actually, really well. Um, CEI because and Island School because they're in boats all the time with all kinds of people coming and going. They have very good boat safety. Um, so every, they did a briefing before um, and told us the rules. Everyone needs to wear their life jacket, and they were very strict about that. Um, don't get in the water unless I say. You know, we had, we did have some people injure themselves, including myself, um, <coughs> getting in and to and out of the boat. So um, that's something I think we learned on the expedition that um, Heather's working with the PI to um, to kind of make sure that that's more part of the safety briefing. Like, be careful. I, I mean, she already said that, but specifically when you do this, you could get caught on this. So. Um, we had a very good briefing before we started any of the jumping in the water, the snorkel, um, you know. Um, I think also they have great radio systems, so there's, there's a boat house on campus and they have a system with them. They can radio them at any time if something goes wrong. And I think it wasn't in my group, but um, one of the boats broke down while they were doing field works and they radioed someone and they came and got them. Um, there was no problem. Um, and yeah, and all of the staff who drive the boats, go through a training, um, so they have very s strict st standards that were excellent. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm sure they have them written down or something, you could copy from, 